Okay, stop doing that. Stop just randomly deciding that you know better than GTO. GTO says here that bet and check are the same EV. So stop making up your own strategy without an exploitative deviation. Ladies and gents, you know what time it is. It's the return of From Losing to Cruising. And today, Mark is back from his travels. He was battling somewhere in his native land of Ireland in an MTT. And he did rather well. And also, not just that, but today we also have the exclusive 100 NL shot. That's right, Mark has taken advantage of a little promo that was going on on his site and stepped up to battle at twice the stakes he normally plays. How did the shot go? Let's find out. Mark, tell us about your travels first of all. How was your live tourney experience? It was cool. Uh, first time playing in a live tournament, so it went well. I cashed, I uh, came 30th out of a field of 770 or something like that. Wow, so nice. I was uh, I was happy. A little unhappy with, you know, ultimately the final hand, but aside from that, you know, it was, uh, it was a deep, to make a deep run was, uh, I, I would have bit your hand off at the start if I'd been told I would do that, so yeah. Glad to hear that. Sounds like it was a, a good little baptism in the live tournament world for you. Tell us about this completely insane and reckless decision to double the stakes that you are grinding. How did that come about? On iPoker, they have a, a rake back mission where they you hit a certain amount of rake points and you can get vouchers for the Irish Poker Tour. So it was coming to the end of the promotion and I was a bit shy of reaching 200 euros worth of vouchers and I couldn't make it at 50 and like I did the maths, worked out that I wasn't going to make it at my current rate of play. But if I stepped up, I could. So I decided effectively it was a it was a subsidized shock take. So I had 200 euro that I could achieve. And it was also the weekend. So it was over Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I thought, why not give it a shot? Awesome. Vouchers, subsidized shock take. This sounds like some kind of like highly social egalitarian scheme to allow people to play higher stakes or something. Yeah. The welfare scheme for poker players. It was well Love subsidized. It. You're allowed to do Irish Irish jokes, I'm not, I'm not Irish. So yeah, we're gonna get into some hands today there. They're not really particularly thematically chosen. They're just gonna be spots that are, well, we have a few filters on for any of you poker tracker nerds out there. They're gonna be like, eh, what are the parameters in the, in, in the filter? For anyone that's gonna say that in the comments, the parameters are that we V-pipped, that we saw the flop, that the pot was over 30 big blinds, but, but less than 200 big blinds by the end of the hand, and that we were heads up to the flop, so we're not seeing spots where we like folded flop and then the other two played a really big pot. So those are our parameters. Let's get into it. Let's find out how you played this week and hopefully do a little bit of cruising. Okay, so King Queen, in the cutoff, we begin with an open. Isn't this a fun series, guys? Let us know what you think about this in the comments if you like it. Don't forget to hit the like button. Let us know what you think of the series. It will keep the series going on and it will keep Mark getting coached for free. King 10 4, two tone, big blind flats, and we elect to use a big bet. I'm totally fine with this. I think using big bets on a texture like this is fine. I think your hand can check or bet. I do think it's optional because despite it being a really nice hand, you can always make up for lost ground later. And there shouldn't be like an EV, big EV swing here either way, really. If they're very stationary and very passive, then you'd want to bet here. And if they're like super aggro tight or something, like mega tag or something, maybe you want to check. But those extreme reads aside, this is good. King turn, is this a pure bet? I think something like king queen plus might be pure here and like king jack or lower might be like starting to mix. So this is probably pure, I would imagine. The queen of diamonds is cool as well because if he calls you with a nut flush draw, well, what's good about having the queen of diamonds if he calls you with a nut flush draw? One of using up one of his outs. Yeah, exactly. So just reducing the equity of those hands a little bit more against you. So definitely better to have a diamond here than not. Sometimes there's a bit of confusion about when we want these cards and when we don't. I and mean, it's not a huge deal. Listen, I mean, it's, it's just a value bet, but it's good to have it. Villain calls Ace of Diamonds on the river. This diamond is kind of weird, right? Because the most common flush draw that people will have is, well, I'm thinking of two like main breeds of flush draw that people will have on the turn. What do you think they are? With the most common flush draw would be the nut flushes, mm -hmm. I would say. Ace mm -hmm. of diamonds, Ace of hearts. Yep then that becomes impossible on the river, so we don't need to fear the diamond draw so much. And what would the other diamond draw be that would call? Let's ignore the hearts for now. This is just hand reading 101. When someone takes like two passive actions, well, would they have like six, seven of diamonds, do you think? I guess possibly, but uh, if, they ha if they had a double draw, so if they had a straight draw along with the flush draw? Maybe, yeah, that might raise, but something like seven, five, seven, six of diamonds, eight, seven of diamonds, that wouldn't really be able to call the turn. It would have to raise or fold because you're, you're not getting like enough pot odds and implied odds to call dreadful flush draws here. You can call it queen high ones, you can call 
ASI ones, and of course you can call ones with the 10 in them. That was what I was kind of getting at. The villain could have like 10 8 of diamonds, 10 9 of diamonds, so these kind of things. So I'm not particularly perturbed on the Ace of Diamonds River, especially when I have the Queen of Diamonds blocker. Very nice that we have this card now, because possibly something like Queen 9 or Queen Jack of Diamonds or Queen 10 of Diamonds is going to call turn. So yeah, I would think we still have a value bet if checked to. Villain does go ahead and the lead, however. Any thoughts? Well, let me hear your full thought process here. This is clearly the spot we want to dig into in this hand. This is an unusual play, I think. I think in my population, when it's a smaller size, this isn't a small size, but when it's a smaller size, it can be someone trying to see the showdown for cheap. But with this sizing, I kind of feel that it's, it's a hand that doesn't want me to check behind which makes it a concerning play. Now, I think I've a, I have a hand that has to call, notwithstanding that. But, but I think I do see a flush here a lot. Okay, Is but we've already been over the fact that the main flushes are just a 10x one here. Hmm. Maybe, like, the weaker player does call, like... I'm kind of assuming someone who leads River on this card is likely to be a recreational player just because you're actually the one that has tons of boats and flushes here and Villain really doesn't. So building a Donk range here is a little bit bizarre to me. I mean, it does make sense if they think it's an underbuffed spot, you know, for exploitative reasons, like leading here to take advantage of that. But overall, yeah, I mean, I would start off here with an analysis of like player type, like someone who leads the river, player type equals what? Weak. Weaker, recreational kind of player, yeah. yeah. So then we have to try and attribute a range to this player. So it's a few contradictions here, perhaps. So on the one hand, you're kind of saying you're describing a really deliberate intention, like this is someone who doesn't want the river to check back. The danger with that, while it will often be the case, and you're right, the danger with that is just that it's kind of ignoring landing range, it's kind of just talking about intent, and I think it's best to talk about landing range, like the range the villain gets to the spot with, always, you know, as your first reliable port of call in situations like this. Mm. So in terms of bluff to value ratio, that's what we're really ultimately looking at mm. at the end of the day, and also like with the fish there's also some merging to think about as well that can go on here. But in terms of this sort of bluff to value idea, what bluff candidates does a landing range consist of here? So in other words, what hands that have the chance to bluff that are low enough down in showdown value terms to bluff actually arrive on this node? Not many, I would say. Mm -hmm. Given that they've called two streets, they've condensed the range to showdown value hands. So hands with a 10, hands with a king. They're not obvious bluff candidates. Right. So villain has to be kind of taking a 10, like jack 10 or something, turning it into a bluff, maybe arriving with some kind of 4x and, and turning that into mm -hmm. a bluff or something of that nature to be bluffing here, per se. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's probably quite unlikely. So from a under bluffed, over bluffed point of view, we want to start off by saying that this is like quite a dramatically under bluffed node, probably, just based yeah. on that. I agree. Absolutely. When we have a thought process that thinks about range construction across multiple streets and range composition, mm -hmm. we can use our theoretical skill set that you've built up by doing Carrot Poker School. I know that you've been making your way through the video course that's on sale at CarrotCorner.com. It's a theory course. If you just start with intent and you just say, I think he's up to this, I think he's doing this, I think he thinks this, you actually bypass the opportunity to use all of that great work that you have done on your game. So it's very important to not just go to intention but to think about range. Once we think about range, it's probably very underbluffed. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a fold because there is another avenue that you can use to justify calling sometimes against weaker players. What would that be? So we may say, sure, it's underbluffed. However, what else might we beat here? He could be betting with hand, value betting with hands that we beat. So he could be betting with worse King X. Yeah, um, and I, I don't even know if I like the term value betting because to yeah. lead here with like King five, seems like a really bad play like it's not actually a value bet it's just a complete polarization error a complete atrocity of a play an abominable action you know a reprimandable truly abhorrent action let's say that that doesn't mean it's not happening because we've already said that villain's player type is probably more recreational so if this kind of awful play could be happening sometimes that is going to swing us i'm going to disappoint everyone here and actually say that i don't know what you should do in this hunt i think it's super close but I'm confident that either way it's not going to be a big deal. Like, if this is a fold, I don't think it'll be by much. If this is a call, I don't think it'll be by much. It depends how much King X is here. I would definitely say with confidence if I had King 7, King 6, King 3, I am definitely folding because the fact I can no longer beat those merges is going to be enough to swing it. And if I didn't have the Queen of Diamonds in my hand here, I'm also definitely folding. But with the Queen of Diamonds and with the best King to beat all of the merges, 
I'm like creeping up towards call being all right, but I think it's so important that we, we look at your protocol there. I don't think it's that important what we do in this spot, but the protocol is going to be everything. Another thing, another decision point here is that if villain looks volatile, like they have like really wide ranges pre, like this player will not be able to hide from you HUD wise, right? You run a HUD, yeah? yeah. So this player can't hide from you because the guy that's playing 4-7 off pre is going to run like a baboon in the HUD and you're going to be able to say that's a baboon. I'm going to go ahead and call. So no problem here picking this guy off. Once we know that the guy is like 51-17, that it just follows that there's enough random shit that we call. If we know the player is 28, 20 slash 8, we have to definitely fold. So it's also very villain dependent. Did you know anything about the player at the time specifically? Yeah, no, I just had... I had only eight hands on him and he, he was playing like a baboon over Then you call. Place. Eight hands is enough to yeah. spot a baboon. Baboon spotting is not really a process that requires extensive samples because baboons tend to let themselves be known very quickly. They're kind of like shouting in the forest, you can't miss them. Okay, let's move on. Okay, when your 4-bet gets called, you have to navigate 4-bet pots. I would recommend just c-betting your range small in these textures to eliminate the node from your strategy. Basically, you're kind of saying, I abstain from like thinking about this node because I know I can bet range, so I don't have to split, and I don't have to like do any thinking here. Kind of sensible to limit the options in your, your own toolkit in that spot. So right away, this check is unnecessary. You've started building a check and range. I have no doubt that you're going to underprotect it because I, well, okay, I might be wrong, but I, I strongly suspect you're going to underprotect said check and range, and therefore I don't even want you to build it. I just want you to bet quarter pot with everything and, and go from there. And four bet pot specifically, because this is a very good board for your range if you think about it. You four bet bluff a ton of Jack X. Okay, the nine isn't the best card in the world, but like overall, this is just a really high EV spot for your range, so there's no need to start building checks in these spots. Okay, King of Spades turn, let's hear your thought process here after flop goes check check. I think after flop goes check check, I'm not expecting Villain to have protected his check behind range with any Jack X. So I think I'm in fairly good shape, or even with draws, there aren't many draws left with all the spades on board, but I'm betting turn here with my top pair, top kicker, always, I think. Yeah, so we should probably start by just thinking, like, how good a world is this for my range, right? Because, like, betting turn always with top pair, top kicker in a world that's bad for your range is a nonsense strategy because you end up, again, just underprotecting your checking range in a spot where you have to check a lot. So are we confident that this is a good spot for your range where you can just have a really high aggression frequency and do want to value bet most of your good hands before we I, come to this conclusion? I think so. I think this is a good world. Yeah, I, th I think I agree. I, I don't know for sure, in theory, whether this would be a pure bet. I suspect it wouldn't be. I think it would be a mix. But in practice, I can't see people doing a good job of bluffing this node. I really can't. And so checking and relying on them bluffing and then investing. We've talked before about, you know, the dangers of turning your hand into a bluff catcher in a spot where people aren't really bluffing very much. It's much better just to value bet. So yeah, let's bet third pot here. Excellent. Good job. Yeah, nice hand. I mean, I wouldn't bother checking flop with anything, but as played, third pot is the sizing. Villain is quite polarized despite their range being kind of capped on the flop because like, if they have a flush here, they have the uber nuts and there isn't anything else really very high EV going on here. Like a jack will probably bet flop. Nines will usually bet flop. I think they have like a flush or they have like some kind of pocket pair plus draw hand that you want to value bet against and it's quite a dichotomy between those two parts of their range. So small bet is fine there. Yep, no reason to, to go bigger at that SPR. Some people think like, oh, you've got to like bet bigger because of the flush draws, blah, blah, blah. Like it's okay if a flush draw has direct odds to call against your hand. You're still value betting against that hand. Just because they have direct odds to call doesn't mean that you aren't still doing well by value betting against them. Their EV is still very close to zero if they call. And that means you have most of the pot. <sighs> These people just like make me a little bit sick, like posting and then like, I mean, I mean, I know they can do what they want. They can have fun. They're recreational players. I shouldn't judge them. But like when I see a play like this, my sort of visual processing mechanisms are just like, I just want to vomit everywhere. Funny. Okay. This is like one of these. Are you sure you're not still at the tournament here? Is this hand transplanted from the live scene? Did you like manually enter it into like the, the notepad in PT4? Yeah, so I like it. I like squeezing. I like just saying, you know what, if you got if you woke up with aces and kings after you posted with your AT big blind stack, then more power to you, sir, and let's like clean up all this equity and take some dead money. Okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Pocket potatoes, go for three bet. You don't really wanna 
three bet this big here in general like there's no need to you can just go like eight or 750 or something like that like, this player is yeah. still having to cold call a three bet they're not going to do that super often and if you think about it you've got three uncapped ranges behind you are you three betting polar or linear here let's answer that for everyone first I'm three betting linear. Yep. So you're three betting mostly just like from the top down in the spot, which means that you have a lot of mergey thin value hands, yeah. And they don't yep. love putting in tons of money if you put in. It's it's actually ostensibly lower EV to three bet to nine BBs with tens than it is to three bet to eight BBs. It's possible. Right. So be careful there when you're using these linear ranges. What are your reads on? Well, first off, do you have specific player type reads because that's obviously kind of important here. Yeah, so I had a, a read. This player was passive, thirty-eight eight over eighty hands. So I was playing weak passive. I think with that read, this is a very strong range. Um, I don't have with only thirty behind. There's ace king, probably kings plus ace king. I'd put his his. Uh, okay, his, question, right? Do you yeah. think that kings plus and ace king? Well, let's take kings and aces as one group and ace king as another group do you think yeah. that both of those groups have the same combinatoric representation within this range like i.e does villain choose this line with both of those hand groups at the same frequency or is one more likely than the other based on his actions kings plus is more likely than ace king agree yeah. so it's a little bit misleading and conspicuous yeah. to say kings plus ace king then right you're kind of like saying i give him all of the combos of kings plus ace king and if you do that, you're going to give yourself a distorted version of reality here. While this can be hands like queens or jacks or, or ace king sometimes, I think it's very, very often going to be kings or aces and usually aces. So with that read stated, well, what do you think you should do here and why? I should fold because I don't have the equity to call. The, 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 the stacks aren't deep enough to call. Right. So if you peel here, like I think shoving is definitely out. Like why would you jam the rest in as a big dog? Like it just doesn't make any sense against range here and you need 22% to call here, but that's assuming you get to realize all of your equity and you yeah. don't because he's going to jam flop and you have to like flop the set here to be able to continue if you think he's just got kings or aces like all the time. And I don't normally love making reads like this, it's just aces, blah, blah, blah. But in a spot like this, the frequency that this is anything but a very big pocket pair is actually just quite small. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we don't really have the odds because if we peel eight here, we need to get back like 80 on average to break even every time we have a set. And the issue with that is that villain's only got another 30 behind, the pot's gonna be 34. Even if you stack them every time, you're only making like 64 bigs back in total or something. It's just not enough. And unfortunately, calling to then stack off on low boards is also not okay because the range is too big over pair heavy in the first place. So this is the sort of thing where this player has played his hand in a way that's indicative that pool has aces or kings like 80, 90% of the time. And because of that, he's actually allowed you to just fold here because if he just jammed or just raised and then jammed over your three bet i don't think we'd be letting tens go against the stack depth but against such a stupidly built line that's basically you know again fairly indicative of baboons we can just go ahead and fold yeah absolutely yeah so, i made a, made a mistake here well that's fine we make mistakes you know yeah. but what went wrong like what was what was yeah. different between the thought process you should have had and the one that you did have I think I overestimated the amount of ace king in this range, but it makes perfect sense when when I when I think through what you just said. Right. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Ace king off. Go ahead and make it fifteen. Pick up one collar. These games are good. You need to start crushing these games. I'm not accepting you not crushing these games. Like, look at these games. You have to win. Sorry, there's no other choice. We bet fifth pot. I kind of think you can do a lot of different things here. Like, I, as you know, I'm not one of these coaches that's going to be like, oh, the solver doesn't like the sizing, actually. I'm not going to do that because while the solver may use like half pot here, it may check here, it will do a bunch of different things. Like, there's just no way it really matters very much at this SPR. You do still have a, a relatively big range advantage. This bet will get some useful fold equity. Fill and folds jack 10 of hearts. It's like, yes. Definitely a good thing to do this is. You could also check, you could also bet bigger maybe. I don't love betting bigger here. One option you maybe have if this guy is very, very wide and very loose and very aggressive is to check jam. And the idea with check jam is that you actually encourage hands like Queen Jack of Spades and the like, these really terrible hands, to bet and then fold, basically, which is fantastic. So while your play is fine, like theoretically, I think like what I maybe prefer here sure. against anyone that's not really passive is to check and then just shove. And when you shove, it will be a hybrid shove. What hybrid shove means, Carrot Poker School, grade two. 
lecture six is that we are betting for multiple reasons when we jam so if we check villain bets and we jam we have a value element in the sense that villain could just have a queen or ace jack and bet call off or like a club draw that we're ahead of we have a value element further in the sense that villain could basically have like sevens and we could hit an ace or a king and we have equity that way and then we have a bluff element not really a bluff element but i guess like it's not unheard of for some player to bet for information with eights and then fold to your shove it's possible right we can't say it never happens chat Please resist the temptation, commenters, YouTube audience, to say that never happens because that's not true. There are recreational players that decide their beat with eights and then fold when you shove here. It can happen even if it's rare. And then thirdly, you get denial, protection, whatever you want to call it, where villain bets like the queen jack of hearts and then you jam and deny the equity to that hand. Even better if it's queen jack of diamonds and it has like flush draw backdoor. So check jam is the best play here probably objectively against pool. Theoretically, in the non-practical realm, this this play is probably totally fine though. But I do like, just bear that in mind, small SBR, out of position with a good chunk of equity and you want fold equity, consider check jam, it's a very nifty tool to have in your inventory, right? Okay, explain your sizing to me here, like what, what are you doing here with this bet size? The king is a polarizing card for ranges, so I don't want to bet too large a sizing. I think this was a sizing I was specifically playing against this fish. I wouldn't normally half pot. What would you normally do? I think I would normally bet one third. I then guess. what was it about this player that made you half pot? I just felt the short stack that they could be. I wanted to commit them. I wanted to try to commit their stack for the river so that they felt they had to call it off the river. I, I think I was just trying to be a little bit greedy. The thing is, in doing that, like, okay, if they call turn here, they will call river more often than if you one third here and then shove river. But they will also just full turn more often to that size. Like, they're not totally inelastic yeah. here. They have a lot of yeah. hands like sixes, seven. Okay, sixes is probably inelastic. But sevens, eights, nines, tens, all of this stuff. Ace, queen is probably to some extent elastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not really sold. Like, you've not convinced yeah. me. I don't think this is terrible, but I don't actually see a reason. I don't think your logic is sound at all. I think you can just like bet a third. Third. and you will actually probably just get called more often on the turn less often on the river but it's not clear to me that like there's a deviation there that it's better to bet the size on the turn because if you make villain fold eights immediately you don't even get the chance to like get their stack on the river so i think again there's a bit too much infiltration here from like the older school yeah. of your game if that makes sense and you want to like bring it down to the new school which is just like is there an ev reason really to deviate because you can't just cherry pick the factors you look at you can't just say if he calls turn, he'll call river more often without thinking about how often he'll call turn in the first place. And at this SBR, I'd actually say that's a massive sizing and it's totally unnecessary. As yep. SBR gets smaller, sizes like this just become very unnecessary and not necessarily bad, but I just don't like the way you're thinking about it more than anything else. But yeah, I mean, okay. You'll also cause more like random spew jams from villain if you bet smaller, mm. perhaps. Like it's it's possible that that triggers some people. So there's lots of different arguments mm. you can use in either direction. We need to be either kind of exhaustive with that process or we just sort of stick to the normal game plan. Flush draw, you can better check. Do you ever check? With the lower flush draw, probably not. Okay, stop doing that. Stop just randomly deciding that you know better than GTO. GTO says here, and I'm not like a guru for GTO that I'm always like, do what the solver says. That's clearly not what we want to do. But it says here that bet and check are the same EV. So stop making up your own strategy without an exploitative deviation. Because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to challenge you to give me a reason why in the real realm betting is actually necessary and better than checking. If you can't, you need to stop unbalancing your range like this for absolutely no purpose. My logic is just that I have useful fold equity in any queen, king or ace-x. Okay, stop. Does game theory know that or not? Yes. So because game theory understands that a lot of your fold equity is useful here, but nevertheless it still thinks that check is an equally good line, you can't use usefulness of fold equity as a reason to always bet this hand. You're actually using something that's internal to game theory to reject game theory. That doesn't work. What you have to do, if you want to say that this is just a bet, is you have to stipulate something that's different in the real world that doesn't apply in the theoretical one, so that you can actually say to the solver, if you knew what I knew, you would think that betting was better. So is there anything exploitative that makes betting better? You can't use theoretical yeah, maybe stuff. Maybe I'm going to hazard a guess that 
when I check behind, I will face probe maybe more often than I would in game theory. And I can't, well, can I call a bet? Oh, yeah, I can call a bet with Jack Six, so that's not really a... Yeah, I think I think with a hand this good, that's not really a consideration yeah. because this hand has, at this point in the hand, this hand has like 50%, 60% equity against villain's range, like something like that, maybe. Maybe a bit less, but like certainly like around 50. So that doesn't really worry me that I'm facing a bet a lot. Okay, like when the turn is really bad for me and I face two bets, that's bad, but again, we can't just cherry pick like exact occurrences to justify mm. this. So I think you need to just get rid of this. I think honestly, what it is, and it's the same with almost everybody I teach that would play, you know, that's at your level, it would just be like a preference. Like you just like the feeling of betting the flush draw and it's something you've always done and it feels right, so you do it. But actually, it's not better to bet here than it is to check here. And you don't want to be that player long term when you grow up as a poker player, so to speak. Like grow up, Mark, for God's sake, you know? When you start playing higher stakes, when you're battling stronger regs, maybe when this site no longer exists and you have to play in a tougher pool, God forbid, you don't want to be totally just playing an unbalanced strategy in the way that weaker players play an unbalanced strategy. Because when I see someone play these stakes and they check back this flop and a diamond comes on the turn, I'm going to go mad against them if I'm a reg at these stakes and I'm a good reg at these stakes because I know that pool has the same deficiency that you're basically exhibiting here. So do be careful, like make sure you can justify exploitatively a deviation like this because otherwise it gets lazy and sloppy and we start being almost blasphemous to theory for no reason. Like it's okay to reject theory, but we don't just want to like randomly reject it for no reason in spots. Okay. And it's the same thing with turn, like while you can definitely bluff here, it's not better to bluff here than to not, but most people bet their flush draws too often on this node for no real reason, and then again, don't have the flush draws on the river. And why do they do that? Well, they'll say something like, well, I've got a good bluffing hand. I have a semi-bluff, I have outs. I can make hands like ace high fold. And all of this is true, but again, GTO knows all of this is true, but it still likes to check here. Sometimes it likes to mix. Would you agree that you're also guilty of the same thing on the turn yeah. as you are on the flop? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. It frees you up. See, when you just you can just say, do you know what? This is like probably the same EV, whether or not I bet turn here. Like the five is not a turn that's going to get particularly overfolded, I don't think. You can just say bet and check. It's not clear that one is better than the other. So let me liberate myself from the prison I've built myself of all my old thoughts and actually just mix. It's really yeah. liberating to do that, you know, instead of being governed by all of your past habits in these spots. And yeah, good sizing for your hand. And you've not made any mistake in this hand. There's no EV loss at all, but I can just tell that your protocol is biased here. And that's what I wanted to bring up. Let's make this the last hand of this video. And then we will make a part two of the 100 NL shot, guys. Don't worry, more juicy hands coming in the next installment of From Losing to Cruising. If you have not subbed to the channel, make sure you do that so you get reminded that this is actually coming out. Three bet kings. Okay, so this is kind of interesting bet size. This is not the bet size I would use here. Which doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible. Not like everything I don't do is dreadful and everything I do is amazing. I'm not going to say that, even though I secretly believe it. What do you think about the spec size and why did you choose it? This is a habit and it's a. am not taking it into account the board in the way I should. So I think I should be betting 60% here based on the car poker school. And I just, it's just a habit. I didn't spot it in game that this is not a one-third bet. Yeah, I mean, based on just objective theory of poker and the character poker school being the teacher to you that's taught you that, but based on objective poker reality, when you have a large nut advantage, you have a lot of overpairs in your range that are giant and villain doesn't have a lot of sets here. Okay, they can have like fives. Okay, they can have fours sometimes, but threes, fours, and fives don't strike me as the sets that are most likely to, to peel preflop or open in the first place. So they probably will open from cutoff, but they'll fold to three bet like a decent chunk, I think. Big bet is better here. I think the small bet strategy is, I don't know how much of an EV loss it is in the solver, maybe a little bit, but I would just stick to big bet here because it's healthy to implement your theory, right? To be like, oh, here's a spot where I can use my newfound theoretical understanding of nut advantage and sizing, and I'm going to implement it here for the good of my poker health and my consistency. Yeah, I mean, I don't particularly hate this, but at the same time, I think it's a little bit weird given what I know you know about the game, big bet board. Also habits in general, we could go off on a tangent, couldn't we, about just like how easy it is to do the things you've always done because of the sort of neural pathways being so well established in your brain. They're like these highways that the thoughts can just easily speed down. And what we kind of need to do is put up like barricades in the middle of these really well established highways that we no longer want and start digging the less established ones that we do want. It's a very long process.
Okay, villain races now. What, what do we think here? Now, I think that I have, first of all, I think their range that raises here has a lot of over pairs to the board below kings. So they've got tens, nines, eights, sevens, sixes. And yeah, they have some sets to some frequency. So, and they may have hearts, two hearts. So I jammed here because I think it's a very mergy range that's good to jam into. And how confident are you that that thought process is still good as we speak here today? Pretty confident. Yeah, so you should be. It's a great thought process. You just got £8,000! Big Chris Tarrant. You ever seen Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Of course you have, right? Of course you have. It's that moment where he like makes the contestant sweat. I just wanted you to sweat a little bit, but you were so secure in your thought process here that you just nailed the spot and you knew it was good. So this is great to see. You know, there are moments in coaching where your student says something and you think that's exactly what I would have said if I was a student and I was asked the question and it really was. There's nothing I can even improve there. And I think that this is ostensibly the first time in this journey where your response has been just so on point that like I've literally had nothing to add or correct. This is a nice note to end this video on. This is an example of cruising. We're not cruising consistently, but at least we're not losing consistently either. Smash that like button, leave us a comment, and let's support Mark's journey in From Losing to Cruising. Thanks Mark, see you next time.